Hey there, welcome to our episode about Pride and Prejudice adaptations. We are joined by our dear friend Andrew Dice from Screen Rant, uh, who is so much fun to talk about Jane Austen with. Uh, we did have some audio problems. My track gets a little messed up after about 20, 30 minutes, so I'm so sorry about that, but stick with us because the conversation was really great. Uh, in two weeks, we will be talking about The Last Jedi with Lindsay Romaine, who I'm so excited to talk with. She is brilliant. And then we may do one other topic before we get back to Jane Austen. So sometime in August, we will be covering Emma. If you become our patron on Patreon, that's patreon.com forward slash common room radio, you will have access to a whole bunch of bonus material. But one of the newest entries to our bonus material just for patrons is that Elizabeth and I did a commentary track of the movie Becoming Jane. We had a lot of fun. We watched it with patrons live and we uh, recorded our thoughts while we went along and you can either just listen to it or listen to it while watching the movie. Alrighty. Well, here's the episode. Enjoy. Stick with us. It's worth it. Hello, everyone, and welcome to Can I Just Say? From Common Room Radio, I'm Elizabeth Stevens. And I'm Daphne Olive, and we have a very special guest today, one of our dear friends who was a guest in our Black Sales podcast, Fathoms Deep, Andrew Dice, who is an editor at Screen Rant. Hi. <laughs> I'm Hello, so Andrew. It's been so long. I'm so happy to talk to you guys again. I know. It's been well over a year. You were on Fathoms Deep twice, and we had so much fun with you. And I thought to invite you here because in our first time we chatted with you about black sales, you ended up talking about Pride and Prejudice. So I tell did. us, you did, you totally, oh, you didn't just talk about it. You did your Mrs. Bennett voice for us. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, was that, had neither of you seen? Oh, no. Oh, sweetheart. I've yeah, been, well. Yeah. Oh. Now, because now I want to know how accurate my performance oh, as Mrs. Bennett was. Oh, it was great. I was okay. delighted. And yes, I've been, I've been watching the BBC miniseries since 1995, multiple times <laughs> <Sure>. I own it. <laughs> many, great, many, yeah. many watches. So yes, tell us your history, though, with Pride and Prejudice generally, also the book. Yeah, I think I... I said it on that first podcast that I ended up, I'm trying to think of what the trigger was that brought it up. There are many, <laughs> there are many, there are lots of, you know, wet linen shirts. So. Uh, <laughs> Ain't that the truth. <laughs> yeah. I think, I think I started, I must've seen it when I was, you know, by 11 or 12 uh, with my mother watching it. She had the, she has the VHS tapes. Wow. The collection of it. Mm -hmm. uh, and I think I only seen them, they were on A&E, I believe was what the, maybe the maker of the VHS tapes were. So that's where really you distributed mind, them in North, yeah. North America. That's what I'm going to say. Okay. Yeah. So I was, you know, that was back when biography was the most esteemed show on A&E, which I also <laughs> watched with my mother. So you're sensing a trend here. <laughs> but uh, I remember thinking at the time, I didn't realize until I was older that there is a strong resemblance between my mother, Young, and Miss Elizabeth Bennett, Jennifer Ale. So oh, nice. That might have been part of my like internal, you know, maternal connection there. So uh, wait, so what you're saying is mom's gorgeous? Well, I, I mean, say. I'll let you say it. <laughs> <laughs> That's going to be my interpretation if there's resemblance. <laughs> I did, and I, I was thinking because I, I rewatched it obviously again uh, for this, and I, it was it was funny how much of it I remember so vividly because I think we ended up watching it probably once every two years at least because it would show on A and E all the time, and we had the VHS tapes for when it didn't. Uh, so yeah, that was my strongest connection to it. When I was probably too young, I was both too young to understand the real depth of what was going on. But in rewatching it, I also think a lot of it is not dependent on uh, personal experience, maybe as strong as some other things that I've come back to revisit. Hmm. Sure. Yeah. The nostalgia you know, is not as important. It really holds up beautifully. Yeah, exactly. And, and the things that are supposed to get across are 
gotten across in maybe a more timeless fashion mm-hmm. than um, the more modern uh, adaptation, which I also watched. But <laughs> but yeah, you know what? Shifty eyes. <laughs> I, I'm holding. Yeah, I'm holding. Holding my opinion oh my to myself. I'm here. so amused. I'm going to end up being the defender of the 2005 one, aren't I? <laughs> Are you? Oh, wow. Uh, okay. Well, um, I look forward not, to that. Well, we'll just get there when we get there. But yeah, I guess yeah. I, I can say, I mean, I think that 1995 one is a better adaptation. I think 2005 is a beautiful film. Right. Yeah. I was seeing your tweets. Anyone should look at Daphne's tweets. I don't disagree with a single one of them. (laughs) Well, no, and it's interesting because I really did try today. I watched it today again. I think this will be my third watch of 2005. Oh. And I tried to, like, watch it in many ways at one time. So I tried to watch it as a film, which is harder Mm -hmm. for me because I'm so people who listened to our conversation two weeks ago of the book understand how incredibly strong my opinions are about the book and um but I so I tried to watch it as a film and I tried to watch it as an adaptation generously because I I don't feel like it's as true an adaptation but I think there are aspects of it that are interesting as an adaptation I would agree with you the the thing that I keep finding about the 2005 Pride and Prejudice is that for people who that film was their introduction to Pride and Prejudice now love the whole story in a way that might not be so just for a modern audience if you just plunk them down in front of like here's seven hours of BBC in the 90s might not quite grip them so much so I do I do respect the adaptation for for that specific purpose that it gave people something to sink their teeth into and say wait I like this story and then to go and pursue Jane Austen after the fact uh but I would tend to agree with you Daphne that as an adaptation as an adaptation I would say it fails spectacularly actually but as a movie I think it's gorgeous it's gorgeous really lovely and sumptuous Mm -hmm. um has a few eye roll worthy moments I might say but that's sure necessarily true for everybody yeah. so my worry about people having the 2005 as their gateway because the impo- book is so important to me i think i feel this way is that i think that as beautiful a, a movie it is by itself i think that it gets the essential message and tone of pride and prejudice so wrong that it makes me a little sad that people will then go to the book informed with that sure. idea of what the story is about sure. um, so that's that's a little sad for me the funny thing is um back when liz and i first met and we were in pride and prejudice book club i like consumed every adaptation i could get my hands on and there's so many i even i think i maybe i tweeted this or i was just in a conversation with a friend of mine who loves the 2005 um where i said that um like I started to think, oh, well, maybe if they like moved it completely outside of the historical period, maybe I'd like it better. But I was like, but then, right. but even like, if, even if you take the really broad adaptations that do that, like uh, the Lizzie Bennett Diaries on YouTube, sure. incredible. Or like, Bridget com- Jones's di- Diary. Or mm-hmm. Bridget Jones's Diary. Those are both adaptations. Um, Lizzie Bennett Diaries closer to the story, but totally they changed the setting because it's modern but they totally got the essence. Bridget Jones's diary uh-huh, interesting. changes okay, a yes. lot of it. I mean, Bridget Jones's diary is a quite a loose adaptation. It's a very loose adaptation. Yeah, just but it gets a bit. the essence. The essence of what happens with Lizzie and Darcy is really there in Bridget Di- Jones's diary. That's what uh-huh. I love about it. It's like, yeah, I'm not going to say that Bridget is a Lizzie. She's definitely not a Lizzie, but the interactions between her and Colin Firth um, you know, it has that meta joy of it, of it being Colin Firth, but also the their interactions, I believe, are very true to Pride and Prejudice in a way that Lizzie and Darcy in the 2005 aren't really. But that's yeah. What I, I would say, Andrew? what what do you think yeah. about Lizzie and Darcy in 2005? I would say the tone of the 2005 is further away from the spirit of the novel than You've Got Mail is. <laughs> oh God, oh, is, is You Got Mail? Is You Got Mail? In it? No, it's not an adaptation, Coming right? Is it? I mean, no, I don't think it would be officially, but I mean, 
you know, my my good opinion right. was long, right? Right, right. So, sure. so it has yes. elements. Yes. You're right. Mm-hmm. Huh. I never thought of you got little, little, You know, Tom Hanks would be in the Elizabeth role in kind of the late second to third act where he knows more than he's letting on. Hmm. But huh. but the thing I, I was really struck by watching the because I remember disliking the 2005 adaptation, which I think most people who enjoyed the 1995 one probably would uh, just because if you like the 1995 one, a lot of the things you'd like are probably not going to be, you know, it is very different, but I was struck by how much it felt like it is so close in tone and color and texture to master and commander, (laughs) which I love. Oh, interesting. I do like how it's a bit swarthy. Yeah, in and, a and way I, that the 1995 is very polished, right? Mm-hmm. And that that dinner scene, you know, the the captain's scene, could be taking place in the room next to that first ball. Yeah, Absolutely, but yeah, that's mm-hmm. very and, true. And I, I think maybe it might be with the master and commander. I, I kind of had the feeling of um, this is what it would really be like. Like they are selling the legitimacy and the authenticity of what this would have been like where it maybe is regardless of how true or accurate it is i look at maybe it's because i'm i'm somewhat of a history buff i i look at the party scenes or the family scenes in that newer version and say i don't really believe that this is what this look or or this is not how england and history remembers right. the regency right right well, well, and that's interesting because I actually commented about the costumes. If you were looking at my tweets, I did tweet about that. And then I looked up what they said about that. And they said that um, Joe Wright and the costumer simply just didn't like Regency dress, which is, you know, a very specific fashion thing with the mm-hmm. extreme high empire waist and... And so what they did, their thinking was that they moved the story to the late 1700s rather than the early 1800s. Ah. Mm-hmm. And so that's which I what think they would be when it was, which I think is closer to when, when Jane Austen would, wrote it. Right? right. Exactly. So they moved it to when Jane Austen wrote it call. and they right. made Caroline Bingley be the one person who's wearing the extreme empire waist. Mm-hmm because she would have been very fashion forward. So that's their mm. thinking is that, cause I was a little bit like, huh? I mean, there's also the Even issue of her sleeveless, her being sleeveless at the ball threw me off. I felt like she looked like she was in her underwear. When her mother pokes in looking like the cook from Mount Abbey. <laughs> right. Well, there's they're right. That's the other issue is that, that the 2005 made the Bennett's and it's and it's interesting because they did take out that line that Lizzie says to Lady Catherine about he's a gentleman and I'm a gentleman's daughter. Like they yeah. definitely mm-hmm. made them seem less less wealthy even than they were in the 1995. Like the you know the whole thing with like I agree the pig in the house and this they just really and it's a little incongruous because the yeah. house is still quite grand, not in its decorations but just as in its size. But I mm-hmm. but. They made an aesthetic choice. I mean, again, I, what what's interesting to me when I was trying to watch Extremely Generously today was that I felt like if I take away what I need from the story from the book and I look and I say, OK, this doesn't feel historically accurate, but does it feel emotionally true? Like if I was just watching this clean slate, which is not really discussing it as an adaptation. That's, again, just discussing right. it as a movie, as a movie. Mm hmm. Mm. I, there are aspects of the contrast between the raucousness of the Bennett's life, like at the ball and in their house and all of that. The contrast of that to when you're at Pemberley or Rossings was really effective because it's a two hour film rather than a six plus hour miniseries. Um, they needed shorthand to give gravitas to the idea that Darcy is proud. And so hmm. that is actually happening in part. Oh, and also at Never- Netherfield, like the first time when you see Lizzie arrive at Netherfield, I think they did a really good job with the visual language of saying she has now entered a very foreign world to her. Mm-hmm. And that's giving us a little bit of, of storytelling shorthand to the stuff that we would have gotten in the longer form 
through dialogue and through all sorts of other things about who Darcy is. And with Pemberley, like, like they went full on, like with that like sculpture gallery. I mean, like Pemberley's just like, yes, it's, it's a downright palace. <laughs> it's crazy. Right. Yeah. <laughs> so again, this is me in my hilarious role as a person who really does not like this as an adaptation, <laughs> like trying to be the voice of some generosity towards it. No, I would agree 100% that it's a good movie, that it's a gorgeous movie. Um, Even as a period drama, it kind of fails, I think. But as a movie that hooks you emotionally, I think that it lands gorgeously. Right. I mean, for me, okay, let's start. I mean, what I intend to do is start talking about the characters. So let's, okay, let's not start with Darcy, because that's where my strongest opinions are going to be. Of course. Um, (laughs) Let's talk about our two Lizzie's. Andrew, how do you feel about the two Lizzies? I feel, well, and I, I guess I've made this kind of clear that my my first Elizabeth was, I think there's maybe the the bigger issue is, and I think we will, I'll probably touch back on this a lot. Is it's interesting for you to bring up the conservation of time mm-hmm. in the movie? Because you could look at how flat characters are drawn, how flatly. <laughs> interestingly through the lens of the time because i think there are ones that kind of defy what you would expect right on either side Absolutely. of the computer, right yes uh but the elizabeth i think in the mini series for me is uh more below the surface like most characters mm-hmm. except yes. the ones that are intentionally done that way but and maybe it's because i watched it so early on in my life is she elizabeth Im- she feels imprinted like, on you <laughs> yeah yeah well i was convinced that a normal person can be this way and it not define them what do you mean by this way she is even keeled most of the time you know she doesn't mm. want to have attention she doesn't really care how she comes across mm-hmm. hmm. and that doesn't mean that that is that's she's the norm i guess you know in, in that film for us I took the Liz from the BBC version is feels like a very whole person who is not uh, who still has some room to maybe become self-aware. Yeah, Mm -hmm. Uh, that's her arc. (laughs) Yeah. (laughs) Whereas the the Joe Wright movie version is very much surface level to begin. Hmm. Uh, I, I feel like she gets across how she presents herself in. Like she represents, she shows how contrasted she is from her family as much as they do, uh, Hmm. almost from the very beginning. Mm -hmm. She feels like, I mean, obviously a more contemporary character where maybe defying the era. I think like Liz, you said, as a period drama, I think that from the very first scene, and maybe this is why you had more success with it, Daphne, I had a hard time reminding myself this is not supposed to be how people would have behaved. Like this is yeah, her her own performance is not supposed to define her in the way that this character would as like Lydia in the BBC version, right? That Lizzie's behavior in the Joe Wright movie version is more acceptable. Uh at least in the mm-hmm. circles that she's in at the beginning. Right. Where it, it's supposed to communicate um, youthfulness, you know, vitality, uh, a sense of humor and wit more yeah. than um, she should really know how people are looking at her because nobody is. Right. So that was the hardest maybe adjustment for me. Uh, I like Lizzie in the movie version, but the Elizabeth Bennett from the BBC version holds up to maybe her reputation <laughs> that right. precedes her. Ah, uh, sure. That might be cheating. Uh, that might be me bringing it in there, but I did. So <laughs> it's an opinion. You can't right. cheat with again. An we're we're all mm-hmm. coming at this the way we're coming at it. I mean, it's it's mm-hmm. that simple. I actually like both of them in very different ways. One thing I enjoy about the 2005 is the youth, because I feel like they were very young. Like I I really like that we feel how young they were and i actually yeah i do actually enjoy kira knightley's spunk that she brought to it i i more enjoy i always forget if it's jennifer l or jennifer ellie i feel like i've been told ely. both it's ely I'm, is it ely? Ely. Um, ely as far as i know yeah no i think you're right um 
I really, I, I've always enjoyed her. I mean, I couldn't even when we were talking about the book, I couldn't resist talking about certain scenes with her. Yeah. I love her wryness, and that for me is like ultimately that's my kryptonite. Like, just that sure. kind of wry humor really suits me the best in any character. Really, um, you know, anyone who listened to us talk about Black Sails knows <laughs> knows mm-hmm. why I, how much I love that in Black Sails. But there's something about Kara Knightley's Elizabeth that also really works for me. Like I like I liked that she was fiery. I mean, I do think that they actually are both covering different aspects of book Lizzie. Mm. Um and each one of them is covering aspects of book Lizzie for me that are that suit the the adaptation that they're in. She's the character that I have the least problems with. Because I find her characterization kind of delightful, huh? Is it well, shocking? that's shocking. You would expect, right? That yeah, that uh, we would be most particular about Lizzie. So, uh, but... yeah, no, I, 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 yeah, you, you did hear how we talked about the book. I have <laughs> I'm very protective of Darcy because I feel like yeah. he's the most <laughs> misunderstood character. Um, oh, that'll be fun. Yes. Yeah, so yes, Elizabeth, how do you feel about Elizabeth? <laughs> <laughs> I quite like both performances, I have to say. Um, I completely agree with you that one, one of the things I found most refreshing about the 2005 version was how youthful the casting was, because I have a lot of trouble, particularly with Wickham in the 1995, where I just have trouble um, getting past how clearly aged out these actors yeah. are in these roles, and I just have to push it to the side. But I, it takes work to tell my brain no, 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 <laughs> just pretend, and this is fine. Right. Um, I really do like Kira Knightley in the role quite a lot. Um, I think, first of all, I can't imagine anybody agreeing to take on those roles. I, I feel like that alone, I just, my props to both Kira Knightley and Matthew McFadden to say, no, sure, I'll try this, <laughs> because, well. <laughs> um, Jennifer Ely, I think, really nails... Uh, Daphne, you and I, when we talked about the book, had just a little bit of intellectual tug of war when we were talking about the title Pride and Prejudice and whether or not Darcy is all pride and Elizabeth is all prejudice or they're both a little bit of both. And I really feel that Jennifer Ely kind of fights my battle for me in 1995 (laughs) and shows a lot of the pride. Yeah, I think you're right. She sticks her nose in the air a couple of times in a way that really I appreciate because it is how I read Lizzie in the books. Um, And you can very much see how she feels snubbed in a way that Kira Knightley shows rather a sort of hurt vulnerability and um, a, a trying to rise above it and brush it off whereas uh jennifer ely seems actually pissed yes <laughs> no you're I right quite like um so i i do like both of the, both of the women's portrayals quite a lot um i think that kira knightley manages to seem like someone that you could really easily befriend whereas jennifer ely seems like someone you could aspire to so hmm. it's it's a different representation of the roles, but I like them both very much. Wait, I want to cut in for one second. I did actually get notes uh, from my aunt who uh, who uh, has come course, up in our other course. podcast, who was the regional coordinator of the New York chapter for a while of the Jane Austen Society. And she actually was invited to roundtable uh, press interviews with the actors of the 2005. So she... We'll see. Wow. If, if she finds the transcript, she's going to give that to me, and I will throw it on our website and link to it in the show notes. Uh, she wasn't How sure if she's that. going to be able. She sent me a few notes about it, and one of them to what you said, Liz, is that uh, Kira Knightley was very nervous, said she was extremely nervous about- You would have to be, right? right? And I mean, you, you would have to be. Yeah. And so she said that what she said was that her mom told her to read the novel again and make it her own. And, you know, I, I got to say, I, uh, I think she did it. Mm-hmm. I like I mean, I like that. I like I like the idea that perhaps she was to some extent intentionally doing a very purposefully different interpretation than 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 the 1995 movement. You know, the criticisms of all of the other characters I will have, or most of them, some of them I do actually like better in the in the 2005. There are a few people I like better. Uh, as but... an adaptation or as characters? Oh, yeah. yeah. Judy Dench okay. works for me. 
Like oh, I love yes. how yeah, how and- right. I love how the other Lady Catherine is kind of insipid, and I enjoyed that aspect of her. But I think that Judy Dench managed to do both the really mm-hmm. annoying thing, but also the obnoxiously grand dame version of Lady Catherine, <laughs> which worked uh-huh. for me better. I really liked her better. But, you know, I don't know. Judy Dench bias. Controversial opinion, Daphne. You think Judy Dench? Really? I know, I know, I know. It's like crazy. Wow. It's crazy. I think Judy Dench is a good actress. <laughs> well, I also think that Donald Sutherland is a great actor, and I, I really don't like his, his interpretation. But we'll get to Mr. Bennett. Okay. I am excited to talk about the minutes. All right. So who are we talking about next? Well, I guess now it's a matter of like who feels strongly about stuff. It's funny. I don't. Liz, you might have strong feelings about our um, our two Bingleys. I don't actually. <laughs> you. D- oh, God. Wow. You disagree about Bingley so hardcore. Okay, Andrew, I'm <laughs> pleased that you said wow. Don't. Oh, no. Wait, maybe we should talk about Jane for a second because I think it's really interesting. Oh, sorry. No, let's talk about Bingley. No, no, no. Whatever. No, totally Bingley, and then we'll go to Jane. (laughs) I have things to say about Jane. I don't have things to say, but maybe I'll have things to react about Bingley. I just, maybe I don't give a shit about him so much. Maybe that's the issue. That is what I think is that you just don't give a shit. Yeah. (laughs) (laughs) I quite like Bingley, so therefore I have feelings. Okay. Tell Um, us your Bingley feelings. Yes. Sure. I think that 1995 Bingley, it, which is what that that's Crispin Potter yes. Carter, right? Does beautifully. Um, he does just seem charmed and delighted to meet and to see everyone, but he also seems like somebody who can hold court with Fitzwilliam Darcy, right. which is very important. Yeah, you're right. In the 2005, in the Joe Wright, I do not see a Bingley that can hold court no, with Darcy. Right. I you see. I I do not understand how these two men. Our friends. I feel like one of them must owe the other a life debt because otherwise, <laughs> why are you hanging them together? Uh, they have made Bingley incredibly foolish. It's one thing to be socially awkward, like that's fine. Um, but that's also not the Bingley that we see. The Bingley that we see, we talked about this. That's what I love about him so much yeah. in the book um, yeah. is that Bingley upholds this beautiful aristocratic condescension yeah, right. where he can. Ju- speak with the people and be among the people and be delighted by everybody sincerely and sincerely bring delight everywhere he goes. And this man, I feel like just doesn't know how to talk to people. He's just on the, uh, on a different end of the same Darcy spectrum of just not knowing how to conduct himself. Yeah, they kind of assigned him some of Dar- the, some of the social awkwardness that should have been Darcy's. Yes. It was very strange, especially since we're given a Jane who seems very capable, very socially aware, very elegant and refined. And then we put her with a man who is silly. He is silly. He is comically. Yeah, you're right. I don't like him. Okay. okay. You're, you're right. I totally agree yeah. with you. Okay, so, Andrew, what are, what are your Bingley? How are you, what are your Bingley feelings? I mean, I cannot... I, I don't think you mentioned this. It is physically incapable of me not to grin when Bingley is on screen in the 1995 version. Okay. <laughs> because this is not the first time that you two have strong feelings about the same characters that I'm just like, whatever. True. <laughs> but he's just so, uh, in the 1995 version, he seems delighted by people. Mm-hmm. You know, th- yes. And the the act of performing in high society is a treat to him and simultaneously and i think this is what you kind of broach is i do think it comes from not a like buffoon or you know foppish place where he's just kind of a fool he seems to jane gives him pause you know because Mm -hmm. he is so uh he delights people and he knows it uh, I think that Crispin Bonham Carter, I do think that is like a thankless job that he just hits, uh, you know, uh, hits a home run when the team's already up by six or seven. Yeah. So <laughs> yes. it, doesn't, it doesn't really matter. But I Sports like metaphors that. mean nothing to me, but that worked. <laughs> that totally worked. Yeah. <laughs> Perfect. <laughs> and, it, and it does feel, Liz, to your point, that when they go out of public company, Bingley would not have need to perform like that 
that's still the kind of person he is. Mm. But in private company, he and Darcy in private company would, you know, I think we get, there aren't that many. I guess there's the the scene at the end where he kind of says, you, you lied to me about uh, Jane being in London. Mm -hmm. And that seems like, they there there is a friendship there is a shared history between the two of them and yeah i mean the the bingley that is introduced here is like he, he has something like that could be diagnosed <laughs> yeah right yeah like, not 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 in no, the sense of like a, uh, very, right not a yeah this is an intentional choice yes mm -hmm. it is it is like he is uh it may be like a condition or a tendency that people might aspire to, mm. but he is just, I mean, he should have someone with him running interference, which is <laughs> just the antithesis of the other Bingley. The one line that Jane has when she says he's everything a man should be in the BBC version, yeah. I a hundred percent like, that is, that might as well be, you know, the times that this was written in saying, this is the ideal, but he is special for being there, mm -hmm. where where the, the Joe Wright, the movie version is, um, I just, that just falls flat. I, I don't understand okay. why this Jane would be at all interested. Um, and I have other thoughts on Jane. No, that we, maybe yeah, let's, shed light let's on talk that. about Jane. I, I would like to start with Jane because uh, I, I was... I'm, pretty, I'm not rough on Jane. I'm just a bit dismissive of Jane in the book. And I think that's appropriate. I really don't think, I think Jane is, and we talked about that. I think that it's interesting that the sisters all play, you know, are all like placeholders for types more than their actual filled out characters in the book. And I really appreciate in the 1995 in particular uh, that we get added Jane and Lizzie scenes. And so Jane becomes, it's funny, I actually feel about BBC Jane um, the way you, Liz, feel about book Jane. So I started to think, I was like, is that one of those moments where maybe your perception of the book character was um, maybe more informed by the thing? I don't know. I can't speak to you on that. But it, would just, it just occurred to me when I was watching the BBC one again because what you said, I do think that, that you had said that Jane is held up as an ideal I think the BBC version of Jane is very much that, like a general ideal, a universal ideal. Um, I don't think book mm -hmm. Jane has enough flesh to her to really be that. She's more something that, that's like something that Lizzie compares herself to. But I think that BBC Jane really is kind of an out outstanding character in such a way that's true to the book, but fleshes her out more you know, as we've talked before, as adaptations mm. can do beautifully, especially long ones. I enjoy the 2005 Jane, but I think she's too, she's too much like Lizzie. It really struck me based on what you, Liz, said about book Jane, about how she always shuts down gossip and stuff like that. 2005 Jane participates. Like when they first come in, when oh, they first really come into point. the assembly, when Darcy and Bingley, and she's actually, she joins in with Lizzie and the other sisters saying, and, and also Charlotte, like Charlotte, they also, as far as I'm concerned, broke Charlotte. <laughs> they totally like, just broke, broke her to pieces. <laughs> yes. <laughs> it was like, <laughs> yeah, I didn't have enough time. It wasn't her story, so that's fine. But oh yeah. no, they made active choices in 2005. They basically made everyone more Lizzie like, like the, the characters that Lizzie respects, they just made them more her cohort than people that she respects but huh. push against her ex her assumptions, which I, you know, in the book, I love how both Jane and Charlotte really push against Lizzie's prejudices in, in different ways. Yes. <laughs> and in the 2005, and in, in the 1995, I think both characters do it even better than in the book because we get more of both of them. And in the 2005, there's just the one minute where, where Charlotte shames Lizzie for, for judging her. But that felt to me like a reversal for Charlotte, because Charlotte had been participating in conversations mm -hmm. that sounded very much like she was a romantic. Maybe not as much as mm -hmm. Lizzie, but, <laughs> but who is? <laughs> but, um, so yeah, those are my, those are my jane feelings andrew you're you're hold you're holding on to your jane feelings tell us your jane feelings 
Well, yeah, I can the the funny thing in in hearing you guys talk about her is I went I went through university and got a, a degree in, in English literature, which basically means you just read a ton of stuff and then have to write a ton of stuff. And Jane is conservatively 80% of the yes. protagonists of British yes, books about women. So, so <laughs> huh. which is kind of like, you'd never want to sit next to her at a dinner party. Thank you. <laughs> That's right? what I said. Well, she's yeah. boring. <laughs> because she's just so uh, sweet. Right. And like, that's why her and Bingley go well together is he's so sweet and mm -hmm. seems charmed by absolutely anything. So if she's sweet to match, then they're, they'll go off and have a sweet life together or she's sweet enough to not be bored by him. Also. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, I'm harsh on those. We don't two. get to see how good he is a conversation fair. <laughs> uh, but, but yeah, that, that Jane, so that Jane fits in that she would be, um, it, it justifies, you know, the, the way that she is written in the book. Now, I saw the, the BBC version before I read the book. So that fit for me maybe better than it would have otherwise because she's not – you. I'm not going to get into the archetype uh, caricature because Jane is a tough one for that. But I do think the – Rosamund Pike might just be miscast for me. Because, like you said, she actually kind of does present as the sister that you would be drawn to. Yep. I mean, and, and that's not, I'm not trying to like slight Keira Knightley or anything. It, she just has a kind of innate, um, the Rosamund Pike's manner is she, she was in Gone Girl. You could buy everything that that story hinges on. Mm -hmm. So in what world? Right? right. No, she almost has too much like just innate magnetism to be Jane. Yeah. That and that is Jane has to be and I think it fits with the time period also that the things that make Elizabeth less attractive are the things that we as the reader are probably intended to like or enjoy. Yes. Uh I would say definitely be in the BBC version because the, she has a lot of things Jane doesn't. But uh, yeah, I mean so that, that's where it kind of falls for me i i'm happy to see more jane stuff but it does and maybe that's a maybe that was an intentional decision to undercut the idea of a hierarchy of them in that jane is just different not mm -hmm. lesser than because i think in the bbc version she is there's just less there yeah um so R rosamund pike maybe you could do some juggling around of the sisters where i would believe some of this stuff a bit more, but, uh, but yeah, I think probably it is just the, the similarities, the positive like characteristics of both Lizzie and Jane feel modern, which just makes it then harder to yes, draw a line absolutely. between the two. Right. And Lizzie is a character that even book Lizzie feels modern in a lot of ways. I mean, that's, I mean, that's. Yeah. Like in introspectively modern yeah and i guess the movie just makes more like you said more right. of that to the surface that both her and jane are yeah especially with the gossip i think in the bbc version you do maybe that's being unfair there is a sign that there is more to jane that she is just yes, keeping absolutely. under the surface as the oldest sister and bringing that to the surface is maybe like okay now you've created sisters that stand even more apart from the other three which uh yeah it's Lizzie's story in my mind, damn it. <laughs> no, it's Don't absolutely so Lizzie's story. I mean, that's, you know, that's what I meant when I was talking about them, all the other sisters being more types than characters. They're not very fleshed out in the book because it is, and, you know, I talked about that in relation to sensibility, where it's you have two very fleshed out sisters because it's about their relationship. And the male characters are less fleshed out. Whereas in Pride and Prejudice, this is about... Lizzie and Darcy and so the sisters become more background like they exist to serve Lizzie's character they don't really but you can't do that in a film yeah. I mean you can but it'd be really boring like it's once you have actual physical people playing parts you know that they are there all the time so they have to be there in a, in when you do mm -hmm. an adaptation 
they're going to be in the room whether they have dialogue or not. So you need to kind of, you have to give them more, <laughs> yeah. more personality. Like one of my favorite things, like I love this, this a thing I noticed this, this yeah. time because we made the joke that I always make about how uh, Mr. Collins should have picked Mary. And the 1995 version yes. totally agrees. Totally agrees. They seem to know like, that. Even when you just see them in the yeah. background, the two of them yeah. are like chatting all the time in the background with each other. They seem really happy talking to yeah. each other. And I just love that. So it's like, mm-hmm. you know what I mean? It's like Mary has is possibly the flattest character, but when you have a physical Mary, she needs to do stuff. She can't just be around when she's going to say something right. Mary like. She needs to actually do stuff when she's not talking. I cannot believe that the 2005 version gave Mary that great line about what are men to rocks and mountains. I just about <laughs> flipped my popcorn bowl out of my lap. But that's fine. They, <laughs> they, were, they were free with moving lines they around. They were fast and loose. Yeah. Woo. Okay, so maybe we need to get to Darcy because I'm like itching. And one of, that's one of my problems. Like one of my initial problems with Darcy is that at the first ball, Lizzie and Darcy talk to each other. They totally oh, yeah. talk. They have more than one exchange, right? And right? they have the conversation about poetry there, and like uh, they about just poetry? they messed everything up about about love and poetry. Like they had that conversation there. I thought it was the food uh, love, right. yeah. Oh, so they yeah, have that yeah. conversation there, and, and then that- she basically like they talk about dancing to each other. When they first meet, and then she leaves. Right. Yeah. And the whole thing, the whole yeah. setup of this story is that she doesn't actually interact with Darcy. She just right. judges him from a distance. Just, yeah. <laughs> like the whole oh, story really is supposed to be set up on this idea that she's being prejudiced, not based on interactions, but based on this snub. Also, the actual snub. So that's the the like moving lines around, but the actual snub is a mistake. He doesn't know she's there. And not that bad. They really water him down. She hears it totally back, and he doesn't even know she's there. She's, like, hidden behind those steps. Right. So it's not just... They're under the bleachers, yeah. Right. Yeah. They're totally they under the bleachers. much less of an asshole in the 2005. Again, probably because they had less time to tell their story. But... You just hate him, yeah. Well, yeah, there was... Yeah. Yes, they did make him less of an asshole, but they also made him kind of more. I mean, that's the thing. Like, I don't, I think they kind of made him more of an asshole at the same time. They softened his dialogue because they didn't give him the social awkwardness. The social awkwardness kicks in oh, after the piano, yeah. after the piano scene. Like, when they're in Kent, he starts to actually manifest it much more. But in the beginning, he's, you said it when we were chatting about it beforehand, he's brooding. He's not uncomfortable. He seems kind of angry all the time. Oh, yeah, yeah. I would disagree. Oh, you agree though, Andrew? Okay. Or I, I would. I would not say angry. It's... He's brooding, and Darcy's not a brooder. Like everyone wants him to be Heathcliff. They want him to brood, and that's just not who he is. I think I, I like word differently. Yeah. No, there is a definition. <laughs> I like that you word. distinguishing that word is, has a menacing awkward. aspect to it. Right. Awkward is what Darcy is. He's uncomfortable. There is no, uncomfortable. Right. Sure. Right. That there's nothing about and, brooding and comfortable are not tied to each other. I would disagree with you. I feel like brooding means I don't want to be here and it's showing all over my face. I'm thinking about things that are unhappy and dark and I wish I were elsewhere in my own tower. Somewhere with right, and I don't see dark. I don't see the the word dark that you just used. That is part of brooding. I don't mm-hmm. see that as part of Darcy. This is just really like where we disagree about Darcy, and I don't think Colin Firth's Darcy has that. Do- Colin Firth's Darcy is I, uncomfortable. I right now, I think we disagree about yeah. this. I think when we hear Darcy talking about it being a punishment to stand up with any woman in the room and not liking to be in the country and not liking that there's not enough society here, I think all of those things are snobbish i think he says it about himself when we get in the book when he talks about how he was raised to um be concerned about his own family and that's all like the the man is just a cut above the company as james mcavoy will say in becoming james no i agree i agree that he's a snob i just don't see him trying to think of another like i can think of black stars comparisons but i don't see him as menacing like (laughs) Like Charles Vane sitting in that chair. No, I don't see right. And that's either. brooding for me. Like brooding always has this aspect of being a little oh, bit okay. menacing. 
you have to like you can't see and i don't get it i just put it on i just put it in the same category as like emo i and i and i would stop short of menacing and say unpredict like there is a an unknowableness unknowability oh. to them where are you to right now to, to i like that. Menace, okay. i mean to, to know to be brooding. to being brooding yeah or to, or to darcy's character well well to darcy's character for me it was always and that was like the fundamental misunderstanding that i grew into when i'm somewhere i don't want to be i don't disrespect or I don't think less of the particular place because sometimes I just don't think of it at all. Mm. It is, I am not made for this place. And, and, and that always struck me as Darcy, especially the way that, that Colin Firth played it. That's because, how I see Darcy too. Because he's very bright eyed and he's, when he's introduced, he demands attention because he seems not of this place. Hmm. Uh, and, it's you you at first like lizzie right you ascribe it to he thinks he is better than this place and he ends up becoming a more well-rounded person than that mm -hmm. but it it always struck me as especially uh i mean shout out to the best darcy moment when lizzie's mother is trying to get him to dance and turns away and he nods and leaves right. uh <laughs> it, because that just communicates i'm just i'm removing myself from the situation i'm not going to embarrass you i'm not going to humiliate you i said i don't like to dance right mm -hmm. and I, just, I see it as less actively hostile yeah i i mean i i never took him and that's why the words about liz lizzie hurt because you wanted him to be I wanted him to be better than that and then he gets to be right like right. so maybe that was where it came for me is that the 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 movie darcy is i don't know what he's he's not communicating i don't belong here he seems to be i don't care for this this is not to my taste this is low i don't want to be here uh, i'm mm -hmm. and everything about his disposition it comes across the way that lizzie takes it which makes it then a little bit harder to, to work back from him because he's also i i'm i've I'm, i think i'm with you daphne and i have a real problem in that with Kira Knightley, it was, how do you do this differently? And she did. And with Darcy, I guess the answer was, I'm just going to do less at first. I'll be yeah. an uninteresting I, character. I, I agree. That's what Matthew McFadden did. And we know from and Howard's end, it, it at least later on, he is <laughs> perfectly capable of really complex emotional acting. And I have to say, I saw it. I I really do see it in this performance. I can I understand where you where a person would not, because I would argue that it's too subtle. But did you notice his ticks? Did you notice his hand ticks that he would do when he was uncomfortable? Yes. Well, there's well, then they focus that. on the hand when when they touch hands, which I actually love. There's aspects of yes, Darcy I like. Later. But the way he's always just kind of like flexing his fingers and almost snapping mm -hmm. when he's in an uncomfortable situation, I found very endearing. Um, I do think that he made Darcy, I don't necessarily like this as an adaptation, but it was a strong choice, I think, that he made Darcy much more vulnerable, much more emotionally vulnerable. At least on the surface, I would say, yeah, in, in, a, in a way that is easily identifiable to me. For me, that's Colin Firth. It's different, yeah. It is different. They did it differently. It's so, but but I do think they both did it. For me, Colin Firth Darcy is someone who created this this facade of aloofness as a way to compensate for his social discomfort. Mm. And I and for me, Darcy is someone who has extreme social discomfort. And I love one of my favorite things is how Lizzie notices this later on when she becomes more generous to him notices this in Georgiana and only then are we because we're in Lizzie's POV do we start you know kind of backtracking and go oh wait a minute maybe this is what was going on with Darcy all along and for me Colin Firth is managing to do this like composure like this not composure this composed version of aloofness but his eyes his composed, eyes are word. constantly telling me the exact opposite like his eyes are so intensely 
watching like when he's he has this face that has been you know put into this attitude of not being moved or caring or reacting but his eyes are constantly telling the exact opposite story in every situation even in the very beginning what like it's like one of those things where when you go back and you look at it again you're like oh shit this guy is like feeling deep feelings the whole time he just doesn't know what to do with it and part of his physical portrayal of the arc is that by the end when they're in Pemberley and he's like watching her play piano he finally lets the feelings that had been just in his eyes about Lizzie mm-hmm. like finally take over his whole face like that's the moment where you see him just gazing on her with such joy that actually like made his face relax and start having an expression finally um, in a way that he never did. He did when you see him alone but not when you saw him with other people. I I think it's probably and I had the thought that I, I do think Jennifer Ely and Colin Firth are 50-50. Like they are answering each other on the same level and I think in the movie version, Keira Knightley brings so much more energy to it that for it to still add up to a hundred, right. huh. you almost right you have to dial back because if sure. if both Darcy's behaved with the same amount of uh, dialogue, uh, it would just seem like you're getting along great, you know. <laughs> if Keira Knightley is is throwing all of this out and it's being met with anything but actually withdrawing which I guess is kind of I'm realizing now that I have a I have a slightly different glimpse into the uh ways that male behavior is shaped. Uh-huh. So that is true. <laughs> when he busts, he doesn't go very far because he didn't go very far in the other direction when he was quiet, mm-hmm. right? He 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 but it wasn't like you couldn't get words out of him. He just mm-hmm. wouldn't know what to say or when he was kind of would gaze off into the distance, he was, it wasn't that he was bored, you know, it was a, a defense mechanism, right? Um, I'm kind of withdrawing in a way that is uh, intellectually maybe, but because when in the movie, when it's like, you know, Stella, like it's really uh-huh. going for it. This, sure. which maybe, maybe isn't as big a gulf in just how far they travel. Uh but I don't know. I I think both come across as vulnerable. That was interesting to use the word vulnerable because they are. I think that Colin Firth's version of vulnerability is. It reads as so authentic. That, that right. And especially maybe of someone in his class. Yes, that, that right. Like funny. he's saying things that a person like him does not right. get to. And maybe in the in like making it a bit more contemporary in the movie, he's not saying things because he just doesn't. And I mean, I think that the the honestly, that probably ties back into moving it before the Regency period, because I think in the Regency period, part of the we like our fine things fine was we are really establishing these classes. Yeah. And even the difference between Elizabeth and you know, Darcy, like, like you said, that it's, I am a gentleman's daughter, but she has to remind right. us that there isn't a gulf between the two of them. So in the movie version, it's almost like it makes all of the decisions that Darcy has seem more personal, even if they're not. So hmm. his decision to be quiet and keep thoughts to himself and be biting feel fueled more to me by a personality. And maybe that's why that sure. character didn't resonate well, That's a with me. really great point, actually. Because in the BBC one, you feel him pushing against the way that society... A society right? norm. And you talked about the responsibilities, the responsibilities that he has, that society is pressing in on him. Mm-hmm. And right. he doesn't get to be a person so much as a thing. Yeah, and we just don't... I, I feel like that's probably, to be generous to Joe Wright in the film, there just isn't the time to establish right. that to the same level, I don't think. Mm-hmm. I think also they don't, I don't think that they cared about it as much. I, don't, I think they yeah. wanted it to be a romance. I mean, they really wanted this to be about two people and, and they very much 
Um, and that's, again, that's still an engaging story. It just, for me, isn't the essence of what Pride and Prejudice is about, the book. Sure. Um, they do a beautiful romance. Like, they really do. There's no question. Like, I really forced myself to, like, really be open when I was looking at the first proposal because the movie is, like, really engaging with the visual language of of the romantic period of literature. Yes, we've got is. storms. We've yes, got rain. Is. Yes. Uh-huh. We've got, I just have to say it once because this is my biggest beef. The most, I mean, it's a beautiful moment. It's a beautiful gift, but Darcy walking through a misty moor is just the wrong visual image. That is not Darcy. It is gorgeous, though. It's gorgeous. It is beautiful. And it's affecting. And I love the ending. And I love that she kisses his hands. I love all of that stuff. Like, if I just look at it as this story and a romance, it is gorgeous. But Darcy was supposed to make that proposal in a room, not in the rain and the storm and... It just isn't that story because this yeah, whole in a story room at her friend's house when right. she had squared herself away with a headache and exactly. yes, that was well, very like, so very different within yeah. civilization. Like their whole thing oh, sure. is about mm-hmm. Jane Austen's whole thing is about how people manage to live their lives and find themselves and find agency within the constraints of Mm -hmm. social norms and expectations like this is what she does this is and she does it beautifully and it is so fascinating because it becomes they're all living in these intricate webs of of society and relationships and responsibilities and the minute you take it out it's a beautiful story if you take it out into the vista with the rain and all of that you know big strong feelings that's beautiful it just isn't a Jane Austen story anymore. It would be a really good Charlotte Bronte story then. It's a great Charlotte Bronte story then. <laughs> I do think that there were moments in the 2005 adaptation where they did speak to that part. Mm-hmm. I think specifically when all the Bennets come to visit and we have oh, yes. them all seated on that couch. Absolutely. And they've got the girls in the pastel and they've got Mary in the gray. Like all of this is working very, very beautifully for me. And I also think of the time when uh, Elizabeth gets the letter saying what's happened to Livy and Wickham. Yes. And she leaves the room and she's crying. She comes back in and they stand up and she just cries yep. and walks back out again and they sit back down. <laughs> like, there are moments where I think that yes. that really comes across. They do give good but nods yeah, they to do it. that away for the sake of romance and swoon. Yes. Which is what it is. I mean, it's beautiful and it's it just is. as an adaptation. It's one of those things where you have to divide it. As a movie, it's yep. gorgeous. As an adaptation, it works less well for me. Yes, precisely. Yeah, the thing that always, it, it, it's an interesting thing because we are, you know, death of the author, mm-hmm. etc. With Jane Austen, that's, it, it's harder, but... Like, the, there's an opening shot early on in the movie with um, Lizzie walking, and it's, you know, like a landscape, and she's so mm-hmm. little in frame mm-hmm. walking across. And I remember thinking the world the world was not that big. You know, the, the idea was, ah, oh. you know what I mean? Like, if, if yes. we're living in this world, Charlotte's life is 90% better than any of ours, right? There's more color in it. There's more richness. And... It's always hard for me knowing how much Jane Austen was aware that there isn't that much offered in like we look back and think how small those lives were, you know, that uh, join me as we we allow me to open your mind to the delight of walking around right. the room. <laughs> let's right. let's take it. Yeah. It's, it's... <laughs> right. And I always that that was a lovely change (laughs) yeah oh isn't it isn't look how different the room looks when you're walking around but but that is i mean i read a lot of that and that it was the world was there was just not that much to look forward to the byproduct for me in this story was thinking how could you not marry somebody for love you know how dull would your life be and great point yeah that almost retroactively convinced me that Mr. and Mrs. Bennett, there was more love shared between the two of them than either of them let on. And there's like a, you are there are little you moments. Are falling down the on the right side of things then. <laughs> the two of those, in, two of them in bed is very <laughs> well, no, that, no. 
<laughs> English. Let's let's define this by England. Um, the moment where Mr. Bennett goes and sits down beside Mrs. Bennett in the BBC version, and they are talking to each other. It's a moment to show us that. I think just that the result is, and I, the proposal in a room. Uh, this is there is not much being offered to them, and that might honestly be uh, where the Joe Wright adaptation just instantly felt this is different because this world is rich and lush and colorful and so filled with life that at some point you have to like you just said definitely that's just not a like it's a good romance and there's really great dialogue now but you're even baking what jane austen (laughs) Death of the author is one thing. Jane Austen saying that's not the way the story is supposed to be told, you know. Well, right, but I mean, for me to say it isn't isn't me not killing off that author. I love the author, yeah. but I'm basing this on my interpretation of the book, which is that it, that becomes that. a part of it. Obviously, <laughs> it was, you know. I think that it informs because you could argue if that's the case, and I do think it informs every single scene mm-hmm. that. Mm-hmm. Uh, the idea of someone whisking a, a young girl away and spending a night with her does not seem like a world ending thing in the first 20 minutes of the movie. You know, this seems uh, like some place where people are freer. Yeah. yeah. Which maybe yeah. kudos to them for keeping the story from breaking, hmm. you know, like or, or tearing it too far. Right. Uh, oh, that's interesting. Earthier. So then does Charlotte's choice really sexier, make sense? Sexier, but not sexier, like sexier, but like, no, Lizzie's sexier. walking oh, with bare it's, feet. It's, you know, it's she's definitely sexier. <laughs> 2005, for well, sure. Yeah, but I just All meant, yeah. wet Darcy aside, the 2005 is <laughs> definitely sexier. <laughs> Maybe it's because, in credit to Jane Austen, these aren't very archetypal stories, right? They are informed by where she was and what oh, she was seeing. Absolutely. So mm-hmm. you yeah. can tell Star Wars as a Western and it works fine. Yeah, tell Pride totally. and Prejudice as a romantic, uh, you start losing maybe more than you realize you did. And kudos to Jane then. You can still tell the story. You can still use the structure of the story, but the story has completely transformed when you do that. You, you're right. You can't yeah. just pick it up and move it somewhere else. I mean, even though I said in the beginning, there are some adaptations that have done that, but they need to then do serious acrobatics to make the sensibility of Pride and Prejudice work in a modern setting. And they do it. Mm-hmm. I mean, so again, Lizzie Bennet Diaries amazes me. Like, I watch that and it just... You must be the only person who just does not like I, that. I, well, I don't know how much I enjoyed... It works. Don't get me wrong. It works. But I just don't like no, it. No, I think I liked it in t- intellectually more than I enjoyed sure. watching it. Like, I definitely watched it once. I never watched it again. I watched it once as an exercise in seeing... The endeavor, yeah, yeah. Right, yes. No, as adaptation, it's fun. So, yeah, completely intellectual endeavor, but I feel like it hit all of the right notes, which was interesting to mm-hmm. me that that was possible. Okay, so I have a question that came up in a conversation with a friend about some of the Darcy differences, although it sounds like, Liz, you don't see that much of a difference in Darcy, but I do. No, I, I do, but... My idea this time that I watched it is that perhaps part of the choices, again, there's there's certain choices they made that I'll kind of never really like as adaptation. That like is a movie. I know I keep repeating this. I just really think it's important to be clear, like how I'm judging this as a film and how I'm judging it as an adaptation, which is essentially what we've come here to do. Like that is that is what we've been doing with these books is talk about the books and talk about the adaptations as adaptations. One of the interesting slight differences between the two adaptations is that I feel like the 2005 is more in Lizzie's POV than the 1995. Like the 1995, I feel like is more of a split POV. We do spend, we, I mean, we actually spend more time with Darcy when he's not around Lizzie, which we yeah. don't, we almost don't do in the 2005 could we say that some of the differences in darcy are because we are existing more in lizzie's pov and so we are seeing darcy more through lizzie's eyes because i feel like it's a less sympathetic darcy i mean i understand they they smoothed his edges a little bit with some of the dialogue and choices so but interesting that it's a less sympathetic darcy i would never have thought that i care a lot about lizzie 
I care less about him. Like, there's moments where he moves me a little bit. Like, during, actually, ironically, during the propo- the first proposal, I, I actually feel for Darcy quite a bit. But yeah. overall, I feel for him a lot less in the beginning, and he grows on me. I find his vulnerability becomes much more apparent um, later on. Like, Colin Firth, I think, has the same amount of vulnerability throughout but his manners change, like his way, his way of being in relation to other people changes, but the level of vulnerability does not change. For me, Matthew McFadden's... I disagree with you. That's so interesting. For me, Matthew McFadden's Darcy changes significantly in terms of vulnerability. He becomes more obviously awkward after the piano scene. Huh. When he comes to Charlotte's house and he walks in and almost immediately, like, we don't get the sitting, even we get, he walks in and walks out again pretty much that's the first time we really see him to start stuttering in a way that colin firth's darcy when he doesn't have pre-prepared lines to use and when he's not being haughty like when he lets go of his haughtiness that again i see colin firth's darcy using the haughtiness as a facade as an armor when he runs out of how to behave with the haughtiness he immediately starts stuttering a little bit and matthew mcfadden's darcy only stutters like he only is at a loss for words in that sort of way where he tries to speak and fails after the piano scene but yeah some the pov question like do you all feel like do you feel like we're more in lizzie's pov in one or the other and do you feel like that might influence how we see darcy i certainly think we're more in elizabeth pov in the 2005 i don't know how much it informs how we see darcy though um, I'm thinking specifically of the scene when she is mm-hmm. on the swing in the rain. Oh, like that, that is very much yeah. in her POV. Yeah. yeah, which is a lovely scene. It really is beautiful. But I I don't I, I again I find both Darcy's to be socially awkward and to express that vulnerability because of that specific um I, was trying, I don't no, want to no. see this. I think he has dysfunction. It I is. think that's like a, a very appropriate word to use for him. Yeah. Okay. Um. I don't know. I find I find Matthew McFadden not to ever seem as proud as Colin Firth seems, which I think Andrew, I think you really nailed that by saying that that's because we don't have such a strong class divide at least in the beginning of the film. Like once we get to Pemberley and yes, Daphne, and it's like basically an effing palace with a museum, <laughs> then you see, okay, wait, these people are from very different parts of society. But in the beginning, you don't get that quite as much. Um, especially by the time, because the Netherfield Ball is yeah, like four minutes in, it feels like, I mean, I we are just totally there, true. bam. It, it happens totally so true. quickly. Yeah. Um, and everybody seems equally sweaty and dirty and hot. And like, you just don't quite get that classified quite as much. Um, so I, I don't know if that is specific to POV, because I feel like when we get Darcy, it's not... It, it didn't seem to me, I'd have to go back and watch again, but it didn't seem to me that we were getting Darcy through Elizabeth's eyes so much as we are, again, kind of being, in the book, I, f- I felt that we were being kind right. of deliberately misinformed by the narrator about how, because she does, she wants us to also be prejudiced against Darcy. And I feel that both films accomplish that. I It was funny because when you said the the POV, I thought... Oh, well, in the BBC one, do we ever see Darcy? It's kind of, you get the impression, or at least my memory of it, is he kind of doesn't really do anything until he returns to her or their paths cross. Like, there isn't much weight given to where he is when he's not here, you know? And and for me, that, that read like, because I started trying to analyze that and then both Darcy's ended up being more <laughs> similar than I th- It feels mm-hmm. like the BBC Darcy lives his life and then, it, like, that is the implication, right? That his life, there is not much to it until mm-hmm. he stumbles on Lizzie. Right. I mean, she opens up his world for him. Yeah. Yeah. And I, and I think that maybe my response to the movie version was he has his life and she sends it into upheaval, mm-hmm. which hmm. is similar, but 
it, 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 it extends or extrapolates into how I see the actors playing his reaction to it because there's more fear almost in Colin Firth's right. That yes, I'm, I'm in uncharted territory and I am so rattled and I'm not afraid of you. Right. Yeah, exactly. If you if you said well, after the fact, well, also I realize so, I'm so rattled, and that is the hottest thing I've ever experienced. <laughs> that's what I love about him. He's like rattled. That's what I needed all these years. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I mean, Darcy's only he's only likable because he sees the things about Lizzie that are modern as enticing. Mm-hmm. Oh, uh huh. Where the movie. I would not use enticing. I would say that it, as a great man once said, you spin me about, right? You're, I, I, you're rudderless. Oh. And if, for someone, it feels like for this Darcy, he is buttoned up before he meets Lizzie. Whereas the BBC version just seems like life did not have that much for him. Yeah. So maybe that is, maybe I, I'm internally, as you made me ask that question, I figured out why I under, why I understand both. But maybe I've just seen less of the Firth version, which is kind of, uh, and also more like really deeply rooted in that time. Like, as as you said, it's a good romance because the movie version of Darcy is any man in any time. It sells yeah, as a romance, true. right? That mm-hmm. I thought I knew what life had to offer me. And now I don't know what to do. Where I would never attribute the guy who knew what to do as like a credit to Colin Firth Darcy or the one in the book. It was just like, he was just doing what he did, he you know, what, what he's done. Be, right. So when they lose it, like you said, Firth <laughs> is I'm terrified. I'm, I'm, I, 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 I'm the eyes are going because I've said a thing and it meant something I didn't mean to say. And this movie version is more of the timeless romance where it is. I'm at a loss. Mm-hmm. I'm in a storm. You know, you're the tempest. I'm not, uh-huh. I, you're so oh, far yeah. beyond me. And Kira Knightley sells that. Oh, yeah. oh, say, I, I love, I love, I love, I love, I love you. Yeah. <laughs> Darling. Right. Exactly. It's not Darcy. Well, also like, yeah, I mean, there's just, yeah, yeah. there's just, a, yeah, there's, there are some choices that were just fascinating to me. I mean, I mean, I think we should note for anyone who listened to us for this long and maybe didn't watch both of these adaptations, uh, like the 1995 added stuff, but for the most part is like, almost to the letter true so faithful to the book and the 2005 like made some interesting choices like i was baffled by the fact that darcy said that he came to rossings to see her instead of this just being kind of like a circumstance that that she was visiting you know Mm -hmm. that was just a really interesting choice and i spent a lot of time this afternoon trying to figure out why i think it's again they're just trying to condense they don't want to explain why he comes it would take exactly the same one line of dialogue to be like i'm visiting my aunt because i do it every year like it was just it's like it was a choice that isn't (laughs) actually doing any economy of storytelling it was so it's so it's so it's a thematic choice Place, <laughs> that I don't understand get. Yeah, I guess that's true. And I have two feelings about the intensity for him. Like, I well, yeah, we have to talk, discuss the touching of the hands. Like, I think that that was beautiful when he hands her off after Lizzie had been at Netherfield because Jane was sick. You both are not registering immediately what I'm talking about. Okay, because <laughs> I was like, this is a, no, this I a very intense scene. Mm-hmm. So it's like we have the thing where they I, touch hands because he yes. hands her uh-huh. into the carriage, and then you get a close up of his hand, where his like you said, Liz, the, with the ticks, but this like amazing moment of him flexing his hand that you I feel like on the first watch I couldn't tell if that was him like just feeling so much or him feeling so much and trying to shake it off like it kind of works both ways like either way it totally works right it does well I think it also works as a kind of because doesn't she see it or does she not she looks remember. back at him no they look at each other so they definitely they chose to have that thing which again they love it in the movie and it's not Lizzie and Darcy. So like they he hands her off, they've really not been into each other, or maybe he was, but again, I don't see it in him up until that moment. So they have this moment where they touch hands and then suddenly they kind of like recognize each other, like they both look at each other and they're like It's it's almost like he held her hand and it was like coming home, only to know home he'd ever known. <laughs> Andrew, I love you so much. It was like it was like magic, magic. would you say, Daphne? 
<laughs> oh my god, Andrew Dice, you're the he best. He was just holding her hand, helping her into a car. Oh, this is the time where I wish we had video for our listeners so that they could see Liz, who is now fanning herself from joy. <laughs> True. Oh my it god, happened. Liz might be blushing. This might be Andrew. You might be the person who can oh make Liz god. blush. Yeah. Oh, I wish you would have video, guys. I have a Granny Smith apple and a knife <laughs> that I am peeling all in one strand, as if this was planned. It's kismet. The whole apple. Uh, but that is that is a very. I mean, if we're talking earthiness, mm. that is uh that is where you know the the Jane Austen society would say these are not those kind of stories. Right. Well, and also that's that's not the progression of the way these two fall in love. Like these two fall in love, right? Because they each one is challenging the other one. This is not a love at first sight to, sort of story or a love right. at first touching of bare hand to bare hand. This is a story of people who grow. It's not about right. Chemistry. It's it's not about chemistry, right? It's completely about. Yeah that they challenge each other, they learn because of their interactions with each other, even when those interactions are god-awful and both of them behave badly, they both manage to come out of it learning, and that's the basis of their love. It's not, I mean, it has intensity, but it's not that momentary intensity. It's the intensity of people deep down in their, in their emotional, intellectual selves, finding someone who challenges them, not someone like, Lizzie in the 2005 says at the end that we are basically the same. They're not the same. That's the point. Right? It's like, They're no, not the same at all. that's We're not so why you're in love with each other. Like, you're in love with right? each other because you are not opposites, yeah. but that each of you is challenging the other one to fill themselves out as people in a way that they hadn't before. And that's not something you do when you touch hands. That's something you do when you engage with each other intellectually, <laughs> and that's it's uh it's ple it's Pleasantville, right? It's oh gorgeous, if, yeah. If if it's color to start, then why am I even convinced oh, Lizzie's never right. sure. liked someone like this before? You know, it's mm. I I that that is the thing that always resonated with me the most, and then the book held up to it was the overwhelming feeling that life yeah. has become mm -hmm. so predictable mm. for them and they each see some right i mean he it's always kind of the question of how much of how honest with herself and you get into the little pride and prejudice thing too because darcy does occupy lizzie's mind yeah. <laughs> yes she, yeah he does <laughs> She's like, she's like, I'm having dinner. Wait, I hate Darcy. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, exactly. On, on paper, it should be, that's how, you know, no surprise, uh, upper class, yada, yada. Uh, this guy has no time. It, and it was, then you get into the right, I can forgive him his pride. But he defies her expectations, obviously. And maybe that's, that's tougher in the movie version because... You only right. have so much time. Lizzie just is that kind of yeah. from the start. So it, it, it's harder, a harder sell to say that he is intrigued by her at first and then eventually changes his opinion at all because it would be just love at first sight. Like you said, it would be, here's this person I don't know. Whereas the story is almost, I don't know. They're just, I, they're richer characters. I feel like there's more inherent contradiction that is a part of that story, mm -hmm. pride and prejudice, massive print. These are complicated, <laughs> self-contradicting ideas. Right. Uh, whereas the movie, we just don't have time for that. We, it just mm -hmm. has to be, he, he's, he's proud. Yeah. Well, even, I don't know the title's even weird. First impressions for this movie. Fine. For this movie is so much better. I was thinking that same thing. Yeah. Almost as if she said, you know, this is um, actually I'm going to have to change the name to Pride and Prejudice because this has gotten yeah, far more complicated. Kind of. <laughs> well, do we think that in the two that I mean, it, I I feel like the 1995 tracks with the book that both of them have, you know, their traits and their deficiencies, and they both learn and change. And I feel like they pretty much meet each other in the middle. Like I feel like each of them is doing the same amount of changing as each other in book and also 1995 version. 
And now, like, now that I'm thinking about it in those terms, like, I feel like in 2005, it kind of feels like he's doing all of the changing. Is she changing? Like, he apologizes. He changes. Like, do we feel... Oh, no. That's a really great... Oh, no. Yeah, Daphne, did you just... Totally miss, Daphne. Did you just reveal that this story is, like, I'm the fun-loving life you know, really in touch young lady who's going to blow your whole world apart. Yeah, and he's like the kind of crappy guy who um, like learns about, oh my god, I, it's his story! It's his yeah, arc and I she's just you. a device to help him become a better man. Oh my god! Don't do this. It just no, occurred no, no. to me Is now, so? right? Am I wrong about this? I mean, she learns a little bit, like... Give me a second. Oh no. No. No! She doesn't arc at all, she does she? Arc at all. <laughs> Oh no! <laughs> oh yeah, he just realizes that society's and that wrong, was, and that he was being an asshole. Or his oh no, she's super very fun. Spunky. She she she's says, "I don't need no man." Jeez. But you, I mean, though. the only thing she oh, does, no. what well, the only thing she does okay, is realize that he like her. you no. Know, yeah, she doesn't even have all that self doubt, like where she's questioned. She's like, "Oh shit, my family does kind of suck." And no there's none of that yeah she just appreciates what he did for her and is then appreciative we don't even like there's not like she reads the letter or we hear the letter while she's thinking oh my god they butchered that letter they butchered his letter post-proposal butchered it yeah there was nothing there i don't Mm -hmm. think she actually comes to any big self-realizations um, yeah, because that in the BBC one, her Jennifer Ely's way of responding to that line and the memories of her family, which we all distinctly remember. Yeah, we've all been her. Like that is her oh, motionlessly yeah. eating crow big time. Yeah, right. well, and while and she's reading the letter, feel... she's like basically like "fuck you, fuck you," and then she's like, Ooh. And then, <laughs> "Yeah," and then from that point on, it seems oh, like. Man. It is a, it is a, a reflex now, right? That that she knows, yeah. and as soon as she goes to, as soon as she starts seeing the paintings, it's just we know that she has been silently questioning, right? Right, yep. everything yep. up until this point, she no longer oh, right. trusts everything that oh, the housekeeper no. says to her is is it's not even like it's not shocking for her at all. Like it really is no. just mm. giving voice to everything that was and already there. Going was on. time to do it too. There was so much time because remember. When we get, when we get it in the 1995, when we get the arc of Elizabeth is when she's talking with James. How did we not see this earlier? And then, (laughs) I don't know, I don't know. But then remember after the fact, after he comes back, after Lady Catherine has come to visit and says, my feelings are unchanged or whatever. Mm -hmm. And she says, please don't remind me of how I behaved. I'm so embarrassed when I think back at it. We don't get that. Instead, we get the, oh, you must just tell me when you're incandescently happy with me. And and your hands are cold. Gross. Mm. Oh, my God. They're sitting on the She doesn't arc. I know it's a table, but it always went to trampoline. And she does not arc. Wow. She does not arc. That's a bad (gasps) film. I take it back. It's It's a a, a fine film if Darcy's the protagonist. (laughs) <laughs> yeah yeah the scene with her father where her mini monologue which is just he's the finest yep. man i've ever and and the even the father's reaction that is just so it's it it, it plays to me and maybe this is my modern sentimental romantic self it, it mm-hmm. plays to me as he prostrates himself before her and she just lays down mm-hmm. next to him so at the end of it it feels like it does feel like they found each other and there isn't a one lowering or one heightening or becoming more in touch right it's just we both learned some hard truths Hmm. it feels healthy in in the book and in that ni- yeah. in the 1995 one, it feels like they have become better people. Yeah, they both, both yes, absolutely become better uh-huh. people, and they recognize they recognize what the story had spent so long showing us. I mean, it's completely earned when both of them at the end yeah. are like, "I learned so much from you." And this is why I, mean, I joked about it in the last in our last episode, where I was like, "Who knows what will happen with Jane and Bingley?" But I have all the faith in the world that 
that Lizzie <laughs> and Darcy are going to be happy yeah. because they have proven that they each elevate the other person to be the better versions of themselves. And neither of them still perfect. And that they're both capable of learning right. and admitting and fault, which is so each other. Like you just, you see them spend this uh -huh. whole story in a process that is, in my eyes, the process that is what is, builds a good relationship. Yeah. And he didn't change like when in, in the sense that when she says, don't remind me how I was, we understand that that was her armor with him, it feels like you could say that the things he learned was to be honest, <laughs> right? To, to, he eventually everything gets better for him because he just tells the truth, right? And that's, you can. You're talking 1995? Yes. Or the... Yeah, that you, you spoke about that, how the sign of his good. Oh, I think he learns, I think he learns more than that. I think he learns, uh, he learns, I think Elizabeth said this. Sorry. I'm... Liz, Liz said <laughs> that he, he learns to extend the generosity that he has that he feels responsibility to have towards something that's more sincere and and more more general that, yes that he actually has a, a, a level of emotional responsibility of emotional openness that he had restricted to a very small group of people that he learns to kind of expand that mm -hmm. Yeah, and that that is a and thereby expand himself. Mm -hmm. Well, it it does feel like she, whether he wants to acknowledge it or not. I'm I'm always really in, interested in that scene with her aunt and uncle, because I, I I think I read it, or I read it as for one reason or another he has started to realize that it is the act of doing. Like he seems like someone he is taking a reward from do from being polite and proper because it's for her. Mm -hmm. But they but they 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 color it in a way that that seems like a very important scene for him. But Lizzie barely has a response to it. It's such an interesting uh, a way that that plays out because he is not in words and it is not internally directed uh he is learning how to be i mean just like a broad sense he's learning how not to be socially awkward i guess how to actually he's learning how to how to perform for strangers and in a way that is in keeping with who he is in private right yeah. he doesn't keep them separate the the um i don't know what you would call her the, the housemaid uh describing him it is absolutely in keeping with how he behaves after she comes to his home so we can well. We're not going to go off in the liminal spaces, and it's the first step into where he <laughs> is himself. But then he starts feeling, maybe it feels good to actually be the way I want and stop thinking about it. I just think mm -hmm. it is an interesting way that in the movie there is there's none of that. He just realizes how blind he's been, yeah. instead of realizing like an actual healthy lesson that someone could watch or read. That is, you know. It's great if you're a good person in private and you might have really good reasons for doing it, but the world might not be as nice a place because you're keeping it to yourself. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Uh, and that's a, that's a good way to look at Darcy. All right. Enough about that. We must talk about Mr. And Mrs. Bennett. We were pretty, Elizabeth and I were pretty tough on them in the <laughs> book discussion. Well, yeah, they're awful. <laughs> Andrew, do you have thoughts? I know you do. Uh, I do. I remember when you were speaking about him, I had the the cognitive dissonance of realizing I ascribed the movie version onto the book when I read the book. And the movie version, it definitely seems that uh, there's a case to be made that he is as uninterested in the you know fineries of hoity toitiness as other characters in the book that we do like he just is not very aware of his responsibilities like Darcy is so he comes off just feeling very cavalier and the moment at the end of the book where he says it's you know this is my fault like i i have sowed or i have reaped what i've sowed in the movie it kind of lacks any real 
wait, right? Because we've liked him. The, the movie or the series has treated him nicely. Uh, I'm going to speak specifically about the series, which I do think they made the decision that Elizabeth needs to have become this way for some reason. Uh, it, it would be a very hard sell if her mother was her mother and her father was just who her father is in the book. And then she just suddenly becomes, it, it just, it, it, it offers more moments that I guess are made to make a series in live action, uh, enjoyable like i think most of the moments they put in yeah they're between fun. mr bennett and mm -hmm. lizzie are great uh throughout it i i mentioned the one to you daphne where colin mm -hmm. says we're separated we're separated by only elaine and he says oh elaine did you hear that lizzie and the look she gives him yeah is like mm -hmm. the most contemporary you know uh they have their own thing and it adds at the end where he is giving her up you you sense that he yes. is going to be feeling the loss of having someone like him in this family and that's one could uh, not accusing you uh either of you to make the case that <laughs> that is purely created for the series to make us like him but uh he has some of the best lines and maybe they are given the fun that is needed in the series because mm -hmm. it, it would venture into being very dry if it didn't have some contemporary humor. Right. Collins, like you mentioned, yes. there is more to that character than just a farce. Um, and they really doubled down. And I think they, they dial it back in a certain way in the movie, but whatever I'm, he's not worth it. Talking no, about. Collins is not worth talking <laughs> no. about. Mrs. Bennett is so over the top. And I know that, uh, the actress probably and certainly did receive some probably strong reactions about the decision to play Mrs. Bennett as outlandish as she is. Uh, personally, like the moment when she is giving the speech about how this will put her girls into the path of more wealthy men, it does break the illusion a little bit because she is just outrageous. I We have to assume she's drunk or... Yeah, I, I think there's not much there they are not particularly interesting characters to me. So I do like the mini series making something out of his character, uh, which is really stepping into Downton Abbey. <laughs> Julian Fellows saw the series and said, oh, okay, no, nope, I got to make the series about this dad in a house full of women. I'll make this work. But uh, mm -hmm. I'm, I'm curious to know because you felt so strongly about the book uh how you feel about this and donald sutherland's version which from the first moment he stepped on screen had me very unsure i think it's I, before i saw this movie i don't know if I, I could have ever been convinced that i would find donald sutherland just uninteresting really uninteresting so donald like bland or it, yeah yeah I, he's just he's just until that last scene like even, i agree with you andrew that like that last scene um, is kind of annoying in a lot of ways, but it was like, I felt like it was almost like Donald Sutherland had been calling it in until that moment, and he kind of woke up and, like, acted a little bit. I really find his character just to be a big nothing huh. in the film version. Yeah, I don't find him interesting at all. And, and I don't... I think that they, you know, in both cases, they were easier on his character than they should have been because mm -hmm. because he really is negligent essentially because I do like in the movie that uh, Mrs. Bennett actually says to Lizzie at one point where Lizzie's like you know something like is all you think about you know mar marriage and she's like when you have five daughters you talk to me about, <laughs> about my priorities and I was just like you go Miss Bennett you go <laughs> like you tell her like yeah you're absurd and yeah you kind of were a lackluster parent and irresponsible and a lot of the stuff is your fault but but i was mm -hmm. like but like you said liz about the book one like her heart is in the right place like she's trying to save her family i her think we got that crazy way. in the movie actually because she has that line no that's what i'm talking about the yeah. movie one is what i'm talking about yeah, yeah. When, when she has that line we are saved i really feel for her like i she gets a lot of my sympathy yeah. Um, and then she immediately follows with, no, you should go on horseback. And you're like, oh, God damn it. Come on, Miss B. Yeah. 
<laughs> yeah. I mean, she's crap, but like she's in a bind and no, she rec- at no. least recognizes the bind she's in, mm-hmm. unlike her husband. I I really, really like what they do with Mrs. Bennett in the 2005 version. It gives me something to care about. I yeah. just cannot stand Mrs. Bennett in the 1995. And I know it's supposed to be over the top and it's supposed to be a caricature and it's supposed to be comic relief, but it just drives me bonkers and I don't like it. Um, 1995 Mr. Bennett is slightly more sympathetic than the character in the book, but his but is still kind of an ass. I feel like he still gets all of the silliest girls in the county all the time. And is just very dismissive of everyone and very condescending, not in the lovely aristocratic way I described Darcy earlier, but in the just um, holier than thou, better than you, smarter than you. And um, why have I been cursed with such a family, which just does nothing for me, I have to tell you. Um, Donald Sutherland, as... I love the character he's playing, but it's not Mr. Bennett. I mean, <laughs> I like that guy. He seems real sweet. He reminds me of my dad, both both the Bennetts. I don't remember if we actually said this or if this made it to the podcast last time, but I, I relate a lot to the Bennetts' as parents. And particularly <laughs> in the 2005 version, that feels pretty accurate to a lot of things, with the exception of the beautiful tearing up at the end, which was lovely. It but was again, lovely. Just not Mr. Bennett. Just some other sweet soppish not paying attention i don't know he's just well they introduce him carrying a flower too right oh that's right so he's like this Which, sensitive like, i don't know i'm not sure what they're doing i mean i like it again as a character choice for just a movie that i'm watching but it's not mr bennett at all right and i mean we do have to talk about i joked about it before we do have to talk about the fact that that we that there is this scene of the two of them like chatting amiably while they're in bed together um oh yeah Mm -hmm. for me the the bennett parents were always supposed to be a cautionary tale for lydia yeah like that basically the idea was and i think it is said in the book like that basically she was pretty he you know he fell for a pretty face and they ended up being very poorly matched well and he says in the book too doesn't he that do not i would hate to see you married to someone you don't respect because you both know what that looks like Again, it's one of those things like, yeah, it's lovely. I love that thing. I mean, there's there there's some amazing moments in the 2005 of where you kind of have these, you know, camera guiding you around. They do that very beautifully. Um, yeah. So I, you know, aesthetically, that thing where you're looking at everyone's windows and kind of seeing what the different members mm-hmm. of the Bennett family are doing at night is is lovely. And it's, you know, and that was a way for those two to have the conversation that they needed to have to help the story. Mm -hmm. But it really took all of the, all of the jeopardy out of the Lydia story that we're supposed to have even after she's married. Like we have to some extent the jeopardy of, you know, of the elopement, whatever, but you're supposed to come out of the Lydia story saying, you know, not feeling good. And I feel like we ended up with Lydia and Wickham, like, in a much more hopeful sure, place. Because, because, right. Oh, exactly. Right. Like, he, yeah, like, he's yeah, kind sure. of a shit, but, you know, but whatever, like, they'll be, they'll probably be fine. I mean, look at Mr. and Mrs. Bennett, like, amiably chatting in bed. Like, I don't mm-hmm. feel... <laughs> yeah, and the, the 1995 series has that shot of Wickham, yeah, like, totally. oh, mm-hmm. oh, I guess I'm going to turn into Mr. Bennett is what's going to happen at the end of the story. <laughs> Um, I do enjoy to, 19, mm-hmm. same as, as you, Andrew. Like, sure, the the Lizzie and her dad exchanges were pleasant. Like, he's a he's a he's an entertaining character, but I don't want him to be that because mm-hmm. because this book is about responsibility and it is about. I mean, this is one yeah. of the big dividing lines uh, between types of characters, and this is part of why we're supposed to. I mean, you could read this book minus responsibility. You can really just choose to never really like Darcy very much. And like one of the one of the things that changes Lizzie's mind about him is her recognition of of his responsibility and generosity to others. So so all of these right, other characters exist in some part to strengthen that because she grew up in a world where people didn't 
live up to their responsibilities. Like that's the that's the model she had had. She grew up in a world where people just did whatever. And and so part of her arc, again, now that we've established that 2005 Lizzie doesn't have an arc, so that doesn't matter at all. But 1995, Lizzie still has to have that arc. And so it's, I think it's extremely important to really uphold this idea that she grew up without a role model about feeling responsibility towards others. And her father is a role model for a lot of other things, but a lot of them are the not great things about Lizzie. The looking down on people and the mm-hmm. what? Yeah. But he's a man, right? He can afford to be. Yeah. He, he can afford to be because he's a man. He just doesn't. No, he does suck. I agree. Yep. Yeah, even it is treated like in that moment is, I wonder if the the people making the series in 1995 got to that scene where he kind of gives his calculations and stated with no real sentiment one way or another that, uh, well, I guess this is the end of my story. <laughs> and it worked out okay. Like, it, it, I'm curious to know if, if they said that, you know, we don't really know what to do with him here, but I guess it's a chance to comment that for people in his rank, um, sometimes it doesn't actually matter if you are there because of merit or I guess it's kind of one of like the caretaking generations Mm -hmm. that's just like, okay, I'll just pass this on to wherever. Um, My story didn't amount to much in the end. And he, even the way he, it's hard to, because they play Lydia I don't know who you want to talk about Lydia. They play Lydia like, I won't say only a burden, (laughs) but the way that he kind of dismisses her in the end is, I don't know, it it, it does resonate beyond the end of the story. Like it is a feel good ending, I guess, in, in the way that it's presented for Lizzie and Darcy, but it in no way condones the system. I guess is maybe a way of saying it. And he is a good example of that because we are kind of made to look at the horrible ways this could have turned out and him basically right. saying they just happened not to uh, it is maybe an intentional, like you said, a cautionary still happy ending, feel good because the things you're feeling good about are things to feel good about, but realize that we got here maybe through just dumb luck. Okay, totally. It's absolutely just dumb luck that there's that that whole family turned out okay. But he can build the fire very quickly. That is one thing I note. They are home, <laughs> and within seconds, he has that fire roaring, and I don't know how he does it. <laughs> okay, I guess that is a few points for maybe. Him. Maybe that's what Mrs. Bennett saw in him. Maybe, maybe without the red coat. But, he yeah. might have. Yep, he might have been dashing. We never, we don't know. All right, well, we definitely can't end this conversation on the Bennett parents because that would just be sad and horrible. Uh, (laughs) And as is our tradition, uh, we are going to, we never warn our guests that we have to do this. Horrible. I feel like Andrew's heard one or two of our shows, Daphne. (laughs) And he's been here with us a couple of few times. He'll be all right. Uh, So yes, the next phase of our usual conversations is to talk about favorite things. Um, We're pretty loose with this normally. Feel free. Andrew, do you want to start? Uh, You can do one from each thing. You can do multiples. We don't call it favorite things, but sometimes we say more than one. Just just -hmm. whatever strikes your fancy. I, it is, it's, it's hard for me because... I, I think the best thing I can say about the uh, the 2005 film, like you said, Daphne, it is a it's gorgeous. You you I mean, you watch it and think this is the director who made Atonement, yeah. right? And uh, it it is definitely intentionally beautiful. So well done because choosing to do that is going to make this controversial as a Pride and Prejudice <laughs> adaptation. But, uh, I mean, we're talking like yeah, exquisite, absolutely. like so, some of the shots are just breathtaking, um, and filmed in a way you don't usually get to see. So I will give the, the best credit to 
Keira Knightley. Keira Knightley probably is my favorite thing about the movie. Uh, mm. In that, like you said, I don't know how you tackle that role. And you do not get the sense like you do in some other films that she is feeling um, obligated to uh, to do the story justice or anything like that. It does feel like its own story that under a different title, people would be praising her yeah. more than they probably did. And Matthew McFadden, especially seeing some of the other things that he's been in, parts of this performance are very brave. Mm. Uh, especially as we get into the more frayed part of it, which is, uh, I don't know, it's a hard thing to nail, and I think he does. So to walk away from an adaptation and say, I'm not really crazy about the adaptation, but the people playing Lizzie and Darcy are great. Mm -hmm. uh, they might have dodged a bullet. My favorite parts of the 1995 series are probably all of the lines that my mother and I just say to each other in conversation now, <laughs> because they are so... <laughs> You know, I mean, there's there's one every few scenes, but I will say because I don't think it gets enough attention is uh, when Lizzie has I'm going to call it their first flirting, <laughs> which is when she uh, asks for his faults uh, if he is uh... without any. And he comes off as a pretty self-aware, healthy adult mm -hmm. and. She says, uh, you know, that is a failing stir, but I can't laugh at it. Yeah. And that just hangs there. And I feel like that is given enough. It's early on overall in terms of the story. Mm -hmm. But uh, that moment always resonates with me because that is uh, one of the few times early on where it does seem like neither of them have a motive. Uh, one of the first times where they're actually getting to know each other. Sure. Uh, and a lot of that is you're going to have more of that in the book than the series, but that moment always sticks with me that um, also that that is not a good thing. Mm -hmm. <laughs> it can be phrased as a thing of value and character and integrity, but I always remember Lizzie saying that it is not a fault to be laughed mm -hmm. at and carry that close to my heart. Also, also, as I said, that one red coat who says, Hey, Wickham <laughs> is uh <laughs> Spot on accent to deliver there. I, I'm Wait, so is, happy. It's with not that. Denny, right? Though I think it's it is one. the other guy. Yeah, the other guy, Mr. Not Denny. Yes, Mr. Not <laughs> Denny. Love it. Yeah, also, nice to reminded. Oh yes, this kind of England was also going on at the same time. <laughs> All right, Elizabeth. Oh goodness, I'm afraid that mine are going to have to be very vague. I I think that the my favorite thing about the 2005 is the color is the, uh, the the visual language and the tone of the piece is so surprising that these feel like houses that have a smell, you know, like it feels very, <laughs> very visceral, earthy, very visceral, very real in a way that the 1995 feels completely untouchable. Yeah. So I like that about um, the 2005 version quite a lot. Uh, the 95, I like, I guess for the exact opposite reason, because it is complete <laughs> escapism. Like every time I start, I tweeted about this the other day, like every time I start the 1995 BBC adaptation of Pride and Prejudice and the music starts and you have like the, <laughs> the lovely cross -stitch, embroidery, yeah. <laughs> yes, and the cross stitch happening, I just think, oh, everything's okay. The world's good. Everything's fine. It's going to be just all right. Things are pretty. <laughs> Nobody smells bad. You know, it's just yeah. complete escapism. And I like that. I think it's something that's, um, I, that those kinds of comforting movies and films, like that to me is what's so lovely and special about adaptation in film is you just get to go somewhere else for a little while and it's a different kind of disappearing that happens as when you uh when you read something and you sort of especially in Jane Austen like you become so attached to the narrator and to um the the, the perspective of the book as you're reading it and th this the 95 is different than that you are a fly on the wall you just get to watch mm -hmm. and observe and sit back completely and you don't have to 
you're not taken for that same ride that you are when you're reading the book where you are absolutely going with Elizabeth every step of the way. You just get to watch this lovely Regency drama unfold before you. And it's a gorgeous thing. Are, are you as worried as I am of how easily you start slipping into their world where you're like, Elizabeth, why are you running? Someone could see you. <laughs> <laughs> Or who brought this dog? Hemline, good lord! Yes, <laughs> absolutely. Yeah. Okay. Good. Phew. Okay. Um, all right. Mine. Hmm. Nineteen ninety-five. The piano scene. I showed my hand last episode. <laughs> you did, but that's oh okay. my god! I love it. Mm -hmm. It's my favorite scene in the book. One of my favorite scenes ever, and mm. they. You're referring to Mary's bravura yes, performance. Yes, absolutely, I am. Obviously. Yes, absolutely. yes, of course, yes. Um, <laughs> I, yeah, I just, I love everything about that exchange and the 1995 adaptation took a beautiful, amazing, complex scene in a book and added mm. so much to it. Also, for very different reasons than most people, I I actually, I love Darcy diving into that lake, but not because of, like, hot, wet, yeah, not hot, wet, it's not I, Colin Firth. Yeah, don't actually have those feelings towards Colin Firth so much. What I do love about it is that it, it added a layer of vulnerability to when he ran into Lizzie, is that he, his that his internal awkwardness was so relatable because he was just physically so not put together the way Darcy had been up until that moment. Yeah. Um, the shirt's a little see-through. Not just that he's not wearing enough clothes, but the ones he's wearing are a little bit see-through. I just I really, really loved that that choice to make him super, super disarmed. Um, well, and also to find that he's sort of man that jumps into a lake fully clothed on a hot day which is a very certain mm -hmm. kind of man i believe the director wanted him nude right wow really and for um because it i mean it, watching the moment the way colin firth plays it it does seem like i just need to get and it, he is private in his home but yep, uh right. stripped to the waist meeting lizzie would have been i guess just too far yeah yeah i Probably. think so i think that would have actually that would have that would have changed the power differential because if he was if he was actually shirtless i think it would have actually put lizzie in a more there. right and she's already got all that because she's there like she's yeah. already like the setup it's completely understandable why she would be unbelievably uncomfortable here but i think that the choice to have him wet just really balanced that out in a way that was just really great. It really just gave gave the whole, that whole moment of kickstart. Um, yes, you're. I, I'm, I feel uncomfortable asking this with other with other friends. When, but he's going to ask us. On I, the I, no, this is the first time. No, this is the first time I've noticed this. When I believe it's Jane asks when she began to feel differently for yes. him. And Lizzie says, it's when I saw his grounds at Pemberley. Yeah. <laughs> and they both react in a way that had me thinking, wait, did they, did she just deliver like a double entendre like that today would be like, whoa, is she talking about what she saw? Oh my God, I love that. Um, of his I mean, at Pemberley? Because they react like they are giddy. Right, but see, Jane didn't know that, but, yeah. but still. I, oh, no, I, I mean, no. purely the way it's directed. I love it. I, love yeah. it. Uh, I mean, I, I, okay. that's not in the book because she didn't have that. Like, I, it, although, oh, yeah. the double entendre, I mean, you know, Lizzie is saucy. Like, it could, the double entendre works even if you don't know the specifics of what, of what she saw. See, I just took that as, it was when I saw just how rich right. she really no, no, is. No, she's joking. Mm -hmm. Right, she's joking about, about that yeah. because it's it's the yeah. counter to what she said earlier on about not wanting to marry, you know, only to marry for love. So she's she's okay. definitely mocking herself. It it's got layers. It has many layers. Maybe no maybe what, they had a, a original manuscript with a little note in the margin from Jane that said like she's talking about, you know. <laughs> wink she put a little wink yes. emoji absolutely <laughs> absolutely Set whatever whatever the early 1800s version of a wink emoji was they were doing it 
Okay, and in yeah. the 2005, yeah. my favorite, I have a lot of things, a lot more things in 2005 that I liked than I expected. But what I wanted to bring up was, I did bring up before these like beautiful long shots, but the one I really love is during the Netherfield Ball. The one at the Netherfield Ball is so long and amazing, and it weaves in and out, and it visits all of our characters. Had they done a better yeah. job with the whole like Darcy pointing out all of the all of the problems in Mar marrying Elizabeth, the ones that are real problems that she recognized afterwards, that would have been incredible because this shot takes you on a tour of those in the most interesting way. And you see, right. I mean, you also see other stuff, like you see Bingley when he grabs the back of Jane's dress. That was so odd. And there's just like all, you just, you're just going through basically everything that's happening, their whole world in this one long shot that goes everywhere on this floor that they're having this ball and to me it felt almost like like a really soft slow whirlwind and it felt really significant that it then ends with lizzie by herself outside almost hiding from the ball that it was like all of the things in lizzie's life that were kind of weighing on her and and that she was going to have to confront mm. even though it turns out she doesn't work but they were the the shot set up what would have been an incredible conversation about all these things that the movie, uh -huh. I guess, didn't really do. But that one shot is just outstanding. Sure. Alrighty. Well, we've definitely talked quite a bit about these adaptations. It was so much fun. Andrew, thank you so much for coming and hanging out with us. We've missed you. Oh, and, and Are you kidding me? Thank you for having me so much. Um, so tell everyone where they can find you on the internet. Oh, you can find me uh, on, you can find me writing, <laughs> rarely about Pride and Prejudice, at ScreenRant.com for all movie, TV, fun, video game, comics, everything pop culture. And uh, even less inspired, less edited uh, comments on Twitter at Andrew B. Dice, D-Y-C-E. Well, if you made it this far, it means you made it through our episode despite the audio problems. I hope you enjoyed it. We had such a great time. And uh, as you could tell, we, we came to a pretty crazy realization along the way. Uh, okay, so what's going on after this episode? We're not 100% sure uh, when we'll be doing Emma. But we will definitely, in two weeks, be doing an episode about The Last Jedi with Lindsay Romaine. And uh, then possibly one more topic before we get back to Emma. You could definitely uh, follow, can I just say, on Twitter, where we will have updates about what we're doing. But you might as well start reading Emma now. I am. It is a little bit longer than both Sense and Sensibility and Pride and Prejudice. And we're going to be continuing with our format where we read the book. And then two weeks after that, we cover adaptations. And we will announce in the book episode which adaptations we will be doing. Thank you so much for listening to us, especially this week. Please feel free to email or tweet at us to tell us what you thought about this or any of our episodes. All right. Take care. See you soon. Can I just say podcast is a Common Room Radio production. For more information and our other shows, visit commonroomradio.com. To show your support, pledges of as little as $1 a month can make a big difference. Visit patreon.com slash commonroomradio to pledge support and access bonus features that are just for patrons. And join the conversation by using the hashtag CanIJustSay and follow us on Twitter at JustSayPodcast. We request that you keep your tweets respectful and positive, and you can always email us at podcast at commonroomradio.com. Thanks for listening. I believe we must have some conversation, Mr. Darcy. A very little will suffice. <laughs>